Every day, declare for yourself what you want in life. Declare it as though you have it. The Law of Mind There is a law of gravity, and there are several other physical laws, like physics and electricity, most of which I don't understand. There are also spiritual laws, like the law of cause and effect. What you give out comes back. There is also a law of mind. I don't know how it works, in much the same way that I don't know how electricity works. I only know that when I flick the switch, the light comes on. I believe that when we think a thought, or when we speak a word or a sentence, it somehow goes out from us into a law of mind and comes back to us as experience. We are now beginning to learn the correlation between the mental and the physical. We are beginning to understand how the mind works and that our thoughts are creative. Our thoughts speed through our minds very quickly, so it is difficult to shape them at first. Our mouths, on the other hand, are slower. So if we can start editing our speech by listening to what we say and not letting negative things come out of our mouths, then we can begin to shape and control our thoughts. There is tremendous power in our spoken words, and many of us are not aware just how important they are. Let us consider words as the foundation of what we continually create in our lives. We use words all the time, yet we babble away, seldom thinking about what we are truly saying or how we are saying it. We pay very little attention to the selection of our words. In fact, most of us speak in negatives. As children, we were taught grammar. We were taught to select words according to these rules of grammar. However, I have always found that the rules of grammar continually change, and what was improper at one time is proper at another time, or vice versa. What was slang in the past is considered common usage in the present. However, grammar does not take into consideration the meaning of words and how they affect our lives. On the other hand, I was not taught in school that my choice of words would have anything to do with what I would experience in life. No one taught me that my thoughts were creative or that they could literally shape my life. Nobody taught me that what I gave out in the form of words would return to me as experiences. The purpose of the Golden Rule was to show us a very basic law of life, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, or what you give out comes back to you. It was never meant to cause guilt. No one ever taught me that I was worth loving or that I deserved good, and nobody taught me that life was here to support me. I remember that as children, we would often call each other cruel and hurtful names and try to belittle one another. But why did we do that? Where did we learn such behavior? Look at what we were taught. Many of us were told repeatedly by our parents or teachers that we were stupid or dumb or lazy. We were a nuisance and not good enough. Sometimes we heard our parents say that they wished we had never been born. Maybe we cringed when we heard these words, but little did we realize how deeply embedded the hurt and pain would become. Changing our self-talk. Too often we accepted the early messages that our parents gave us. We heard, eat your spinach, clean your room, or make your bed, in order to be loved. You got the idea that you were only acceptable if you did certain things, that acceptance and love were conditional. However, that was according to somebody's idea of what was worthwhile and had nothing to do with your deep inner self-worth. You got the idea that you could only exist if you did these things to please others. Otherwise, you did not have permission to even exist. These early messages contribute to what I call our self-talk, the way we talk to ourselves. The way we talk to ourselves inwardly is really important because it becomes the basis of our spoken words. 
It sets up the mental atmosphere in which we operate and which attracts to us our experiences. If we belittle ourselves, life is going to mean very little to us. If we love and appreciate ourselves, then life can be a wonderful, joyous gift. If our lives are unhappy, or if we are feeling unfulfilled, it's very easy to blame our parents or them and say it's all their fault. However, if we do, we stay stuck in our conditions, our problems, and our frustrations. Words of blame will not bring us freedom. Remember, there is a power in our words. Again, our power comes from taking responsibility for our lives. I know it sounds scary to be responsible for our lives, but we really are, whether we accept it or not. If we want to be responsible for our lives, we've got to be responsible for our mouths. The words and phrases we say are only extensions of our thoughts. Start to listen to what you say. If you hear yourself using negative or limiting words, change them. If I hear a negative story, I don't go around repeating it to everyone. I think it has gone far enough and I let it go. If I hear a positive story, however, I will tell everyone. When you are out with other people, begin to listen to what they say and how they say it. See if you can connect what they say with what they are experiencing in life. Many, many people live their lives in shoulds. Should is a word that my ear is very attuned to. It is as if a bell goes off every time I hear it. Often I will hear people use a dozen shoulds in a paragraph. These same people wonder why their lives are so rigid or why they can't move out of a situation. They want a lot of control over things that they cannot control. They are either making themselves wrong or making someone else wrong. And then they question why they aren't living lives of freedom. We can also remove the expression have to from our vocabulary and our thinking as well. When we do, we will release a lot of self-imposed pressure on ourselves. We create tremendous pressure by saying, I have to go to work, I have to do this, I have to, I have to. Instead, let's begin to say choose to. I choose to go to work because it pays the rent right now or whatever. Come from choice. Choose to puts a whole different perspective on our lives. Everything we do is by choice, even though it may not seem to be so. A lot of us also use the word but. We make statements, then we say but, which heads us in two different directions. We give conflicting messages to ourselves. Listen to how you use the word but the next time you speak. Another expression we could be mindful of is don't forget. We are so used to saying don't forget this or that, and what happens? We forget. We really want to remember, and instead we forget. So we can begin to use the phrase please remember in place of don't forget, or I will always remember instead of I will never forget. When you wake up in the morning, do you curse the fact that you have to go to work? Do you complain about the weather? Do you grumble that your back or your head hurts? What is the second and third thing you think or say? Do you yell at the children to get up? Most people say more or less the same thing every morning. How does what you say start your day? Is it positive and cheerful and wonderful? Or is it whining and condemning? If you grumble and complain and moan, you're setting yourself up for just such a day. What are your last thoughts before going to bed? Are they powerful, healing thoughts or poverty, worry thoughts? When I speak of poverty thoughts, I don't mean only about the lack of money. It can be a negative way of thinking about anything in your life any part of your life that is not flowing freely. Do you worry about tomorrow? Usually, I will read something positive before I go to sleep. 
I am aware that when I sleep, I am doing a lot of clearing that will prepare me for the next day. I find it very helpful to turn over to my dreams any problems or questions I may have. I know my dreams will help me take care of whatever is going on in my life. I am the only person who can think in my mind, just like you are the only person who can think in your mind. Nobody can force us to think in a different way. We choose our thoughts, and these are the basis for our self-talk. As I experienced how this process worked more in my life, I began to live more of what I was teaching others. I really watched my words and my thoughts, and I constantly forgave myself for not being perfect. I allowed myself to be me, rather than struggling to be a super person who may only be acceptable in others' eyes. When I began for the first time to trust life and to see it as a friendly place, I lightened up. My humor became less biting and more truly funny. I worked on releasing criticism and judgment of myself and other people, and I stopped telling disaster stories. We are so quick to spread bad news. It's just amazing. I stopped reading the newspaper and gave up the 11 o'clock news at night because all the reports were concerned with disaster and violence and very little good news. I realized that most people don't want to hear good news. They love to hear bad news so that they have something to complain about. Too many of us keep recycling the negative stories until we believe that there is only bad in the world. For a while there was a radio station that broadcast only good news, but it went out of business. When I had my cancer, I decided to stop gossiping, and to my surprise I found I had nothing to say to anyone. I became aware that whenever I met a friend, I would immediately dish the latest dirt with them. Eventually I discovered there were other ways of talking, although it wasn't an easy habit to break. Nonetheless, if I gossiped about other people, then other people probably gossiped about me, because what we give out, we get back. As I worked more and more with people, I really began to listen to what they said. I really began to hear the words, not just get the general drift. Usually after ten minutes with a new client, I could tell exactly why they had a problem, because I could hear the words they were using. I could understand them by the way they were talking. I knew that their words were contributing to their problems. If they were talking negatively, imagine what their self-talk was like. It must be more of the same negative programming, poverty thinking as I called it. A little exercise I suggest you do is to put a tape recorder by your telephone and every time you make or get a call, push the record button. When the tape is full on both sides, listen to what you've been saying and how you say it. You will probably be amazed. You will begin to hear the words you use and the inflection of your voice. You will begin to become aware. If you find yourself saying something three times or more, write it down because it is a pattern. Some of the patterns may be positive and supportive, and you may also have some very negative patterns that you repeat over and over and over again. The Power of the Subconscious Mind In light of what I've been speaking of, I want to discuss the power of our subconscious minds. Our subconscious minds make no judgments. The subconscious mind accepts everything we say and creates according to our beliefs. It always says yes. Our subconscious minds love us enough to give us what we declare. We have choice, though. If we choose these poverty beliefs and concepts, then it is assumed that we want them. It will continue to give us these things until we are willing to change our thoughts and words and beliefs for the better. We are never stuck because we can always choose again. There are billions and billions of thoughts from which to choose. Our subconscious minds don't know true from false or right from wrong. We don't want to deprecate ourselves in any way. 
We don't want to say something like, oh, stupid old me, because the subconscious mind will pick up this self-talk, and after a while you will feel that way. If you say it enough times, it will become a belief in your subconscious. The subconscious mind has no sense of humor, and it is important for you to know and understand this concept. You cannot make a joke about yourself and think it doesn't mean anything. If it is a put-down about yourself, even if you're trying to be cute or funny about it, the subconscious mind accepts it as true. I don't let people tell put-down jokes in my workshops. They can be raunchy but not put-downs of a nationality or sex or whatever. So don't joke about yourself and make derogatory remarks about yourself because they will not create good experiences for you. Don't belittle others either. The subconscious mind doesn't distinguish between you and the other person. It hears the words and it believes you are talking about yourself. The next time you want to criticize someone, ask why you feel that way about yourself. You only see in others what you see in yourself. Instead of criticizing others, praise them, and within a month, you will see enormous change within you. Our words are really a matter of approach and attitude. Notice the way that lonely, unhappy, poor, sick people talk. What words do they use? What have they accepted as the truth for themselves? How do they describe themselves? How do they describe their work, their lives, their relationships? What do they look forward to? Be aware of their words, but please don't run around telling strangers that they are ruining their lives by the way they talk. Don't do it to your family and friends either, because the information will not be appreciated. Instead, use this information to begin to make the connection for yourself and practice it if you want your life to change. Because even on the smallest level, if you change the way you talk, your experiences are going to change. If you are a person with an illness who believes that it is fatal and that you're going to die and that life is no good because nothing ever works for you, then guess what? You can choose to release your negative concept of life. Start affirming for yourself that you are a person who is lovable and that you are worth healing and that you attract everything you need on the physical level to contribute to your healing. Know that you are willing to get well and that it is safe for you to get well. Many people only feel safe when they are sick. They are usually the kind that have difficulty saying the word no. The only way they can say no is by saying, I'm too sick to do it. It's a perfect excuse. I remember a woman at one of my workshops who had three cancer operations. She couldn't say no to anybody. Her father was a doctor, and she was Daddy's good little girl, so whatever Daddy told her to do, she did. It was impossible for her to say no. No matter what you asked her, she had to say yes. It took four days to get her to literally shriek no at the top of her lungs. I had her do it while shaking her fist, no, 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 and once she got into it, she loved it. I find that many women with breast cancer can't say no. They nourish everybody except themselves. One of the things I recommend to a woman with breast cancer is that she must learn to say no, no, I don't want to do it, no. Two or three months of saying no to everything and everyone will begin to turn things around. She needs to nourish herself by saying, this is what I want to do, not what you want me to do. When I used to work with clients privately, I would hear them argue on behalf of their limitations, and they would always want me to know why they were stuck because of one reason or another. If we believe we are stuck and accept that we are stuck, then we are stuck. We get stuck because our negative beliefs are being fulfilled. Instead, let's begin to focus on our strengths. Many of you tell me that my tapes saved your lives. 
I want you to realize that no book or tape is going to save you. A little piece of tape in a plastic box is not saving your life. What you are doing with the information is what matters. I can give you plenty of ideas, yet what you do with them is going to count. I suggest that you listen to a particular tape over and over again for a month or more so that the ideas become a new habit pattern. I'm not your healer or savior. The only person who's going to make a change in your life is you. Now, what are the messages you want to hear? I know I say this over and over again. Loving yourself is the most important thing you can do because when you love yourself, you're not going to hurt yourself or anyone else. It's my prescription for world peace. If I don't hurt me and I don't hurt you, how can we have war? The more of us who can get to that place, the better the planet will be. Let's begin to be conscious of what is going on by listening to the words we speak to ourselves and to others. Then we can begin to make the changes that will help heal ourselves as well as the rest of the planet. Be willing to take the first step, no matter how small it is. Concentrate on the fact that you are willing to learn. Absolute miracles will happen. Affirmations do work. Now that we understand a little bit more about how powerful our thoughts and words are, we can choose to retrain our thinking and speaking into positive patterns if we're going to get beneficial results. Are you willing to change your self-talk into positive affirmations? Remember, every time you think a thought and every time you speak a word, you are saying an affirmation. An affirmation is a beginning point. It opens the way to change. In essence, you are saying to your subconscious mind, I am taking responsibility. I am aware that there is something I can do to change. When I talk about doing affirmations, I mean to consciously choose sentences or words that will either help to eliminate something from your life or help to create something new in your life. And you do this in a positive way. If you say, I don't want to be sick anymore, the subconscious mind hears sick more. Now you want to tell it clearly what you do want. That is, say, I am a healthy person. I radiate good health. The subconscious mind is very straightforward. It has no strategy or designs. What it hears is what it does. If you say, I hate this car, it doesn't give you a wonderful new car because it doesn't know what you want. Even if you get a new car, you will probably hate it soon because that is what you've been saying about it. The subconscious only hears, hate this car. You need to clearly declare your desires in a positive way, as in, I have a beautiful new car that suits all my needs, or I always have a car that I love. If there is something in your life that you really dislike, I have found one of the quickest ways to release it is to bless it with love. I bless you with love and I release you and let you go. This works for people, situations, objects, and living quarters. You could even try it on a habit you would like to be free of and see what happens. I knew one man who said, I bless you with love and release you from my life to every cigarette he smoked. After a few days, his desire for smoking was considerably less, and in a few weeks the habit was gone. You deserve good. Think for a moment. What is it you really want right now? What is it you want today in your life? Think about it and then say, I accept for myself whatever it is that you want. This is where I find that most of us get stuck. The bottom line is the belief that we don't deserve to have what we want. Our personal power lies in the way we perceive our deservability. Our not deserving comes from childhood messages. Again, we don't have to feel that we cannot change because of these messages. Often people will come to me and say, Louise, affirmations don't work. It really has nothing to do with affirmations. It is the fact that we don't believe we deserve the good. 
The way to find out if you believe that you deserve something is to say an affirmation and notice the thoughts that come up as you say it. Then write them down, because when you see these thoughts on paper, they will be very clear to you. The only thing that keeps you from deserving or loving yourself or whatever is someone else's belief or opinion that you have accepted as truth. When we don't believe that we deserve good, we will knock the pinnings out from under ourselves, which we can do in a variety of ways. We can create chaos, we can lose things, we can hurt ourselves, or have physical problems like falling or have accidents. We want to start believing that we deserve all the good that life has to offer. In order to reprogram the false or negative belief, what would be the first thought that you would need to begin to create this new whatever in your life? What would be the building block or the foundation that you would need to stand on? What would be the sort of thing that you would need to know for yourself to believe to accept? Some good thoughts to start with could be, I am worthwhile. I am deserving. I love myself. I allow myself to be fulfilled, etc. These concepts form the very basis of beliefs on which you can build. Do your affirmations on top of these building blocks to create what you want. Whenever I speak somewhere, someone will come up to me at the end of the lecture or will write me a letter and tell me that he or she has had a healing take place while they were in the room. Sometimes it's very minor and sometimes it's quite dramatic. A woman came up to me once and told me that she had had a lump in her breast and it literally disappeared during the lecture. She heard something and she decided to let something go. This is a good example of how powerful we are. When we are not ready to let something go, when we really want to hold on to something because it's serving us in some way, it doesn't matter what we do, it probably won't work. However, when we are ready to let it go, as this woman was, it's amazing how the smallest circumstance can help us release it. If you still have a habit that you haven't released, ask yourself how it serves you. What do you get out of it? If you can't get an answer, ask in a different way. If I no longer had this habit, what would happen? Very often the answer is, my life would be better. So it comes back to the fact that we believe we don't deserve a better life in some way. Ordering from the Cosmic Kitchen When you first say an affirmation, it may not seem true. But remember, affirmations are like planting seeds in the ground. When you put a seed in the ground, you don't get a full-grown plant the next day. We need to be patient during the growing season. As you continue to say the affirmation, either you will be ready to release whatever you don't want and the affirmation will become true, or it will open a new avenue to you, or you may get a brilliant brainstorm, or a friend may call you and say, have you tried this? You will be led to the next step that will help you. Keep your affirmations in the present tense. You can sing them and make a jingle out of them so that they repeat over and over in your head. Remember that you cannot affect a specific person's actions with your affirmations. To affirm that John is now in love with me is a form of manipulation and it is trying to have control over another person's life. It will usually have a boomerang effect on you. You will become very unhappy when you don't get what you want. You can say, I am now loved by a wonderful man who is and list the qualities that you want in the relationship. That way you allow the power within you to bring to you the perfect person to fill that bill who may possibly be John. You don't know what another person's spiritual lesson is and you don't have a right to interfere in their life process. You certainly wouldn't want someone else doing it to you. If someone is ill, bless them and send them love and peace but don't demand that they get well. I like to think of doing affirmations as placing our order in the cosmic kitchen. 
If you go to a restaurant and the waiter or waitress comes and takes your order, you don't follow them into the kitchen to see if the chef got the order or how he's going to prepare the food. You sit and drink water or coffee or tea or you talk to your friend and maybe eat your roll. You assume that your food is being prepared and will be out when it's ready. It's the same when we begin to do affirmations. When we put our order into the cosmic kitchen, the great chef, our higher power, is working on it. So you go on with your life and know that it is being taken care of. It's on order. It's happening. Now, if the food comes out and it isn't exactly what you ordered, and if you have self-esteem, you will send it back. If not, you will eat it. You also have a right to do that with the cosmic kitchen. If you don't get exactly what you want, you can say, no, that's not quite it. This is what I want. Perhaps you weren't clear in your ordering. The idea here, too, is to let go. At the end of my treatments and meditations, I use the words, and so it is. It's a way of saying, higher power, it's in your hands now. I release it to you. Reprogramming the subconscious mind. The thoughts we think accumulate, and when we are unaware, the old thought resurfaces. When we are reprogramming our minds, it is normal and natural that we go a little forward, we come a little back, and we go a little forward again. It's part of practicing. I don't think there is any new skill that you can learn absolutely 100% in the first few minutes. Do you remember when you first learned how to use a computer, how frustrating it was? It took practice. You had to learn how it worked, to learn its laws and systems. I called my first computer my magic lady, for when I mastered her rules, she did indeed deliver what seemed like magic to me. Yet while I was learning, the way she would teach me I was off track or going in the wrong direction was to devour pages of work that I would then have to do all over again. Out of all the mistakes, I learned how to flow with the system, to flow with the system of life, you want to become aware that your subconscious mind is like a computer. Garbage in, garbage out. If you put negative thoughts in, then negative experiences come out. Yes, it takes time and practice to learn the new ways of thinking. Be patient with yourself. When you are learning something new and the old pattern returns, are you going to say, oh, I didn't learn anything? Or are you going to say, okay, that's all right, come on, let's do it again the new way? Or say you cleared an issue and think you'll never have to deal with it again. How do you know if you've really worked it through unless you test yourself? So you bring up the old situation one more time and watch how you react. If you jump right back into the old way of reacting to it, then you know you haven't really learned that particular lesson and you need to do more work on it. That's all it means. You want to realize it's only a little test to see how far you've come. If you begin to repeat your affirmations, the new statements of truth about yourself, you give yourself an opportunity to react differently. Whether it's a health problem, a financial one, or a relationship difficulty, if you react in a new way to the situation, then you're on your way to having another issue handled, and you can move on to other areas. Remember, too, that we work on layers at a time. You can reach a plateau and think, I've done it, and then later on some old issue resurfaces and you may injure yourself or get sick and you don't get better for some time. Look to see what the underlying beliefs are. It may mean that you have some more work to do because you are going to the next deeper layer. Don't feel that you're not good enough because something you've worked to clear comes up again. When I discovered that I was not a bad person because once again I was facing an old issue, it became much easier for me to keep going. I learned to say to myself, Louise, you're doing very well. Look how far you have come. You just need more practice. And I love you. 
I believe that each one of us decides to incarnate upon this planet at particular points in time and space. We have chosen to come here to learn a particular lesson that will advance us on our spiritual evolutionary pathway. One of the ways to allow the process of life to unfold for you in a positive, healthy way is to declare your own personal truths. Choose to move away from the limiting beliefs that have been denying you the benefits you so desire. Declare that your negative thought patterns will be erased from your mind. Let go of your fears and burdens. For a long time now, I have been believing the following ideas, and they have worked for me. Everything I need to know is revealed to me. Everything I need comes to me in the perfect time-space sequence. Life is a joy and filled with love. I am loving and lovable and loved. I am healthy and filled with energy. Prosper wherever I turn. I am willing to change and to grow. And all is well in my world. I have learned that we don't always stay positive 100% of the time, and I include myself in this knowledge. As much as possible, I see life as a wonderful, joyous experience. I believe that I am safe. I have made it a personal law for me. I believe that everything I need to know is revealed to me, so I need to keep my eyes and ears open. When I had cancer, I remember thinking that a foot reflexologist would be very helpful to me. One evening I went to a lecture of some sort. Usually I sit in the front row because I like being close to the speaker. However, that night I was compelled to sit in the back row, and right after I sat down, a foot reflexologist sat next to me. We began to talk, and I learned that he even made house calls. I didn't have to look for him. He came to me. I also believe that whatever I need comes to me in the perfect time-space sequence. When something goes wrong in my life, I immediately start to think, all is well, it's okay, I know that this is all right, it's a lesson, it's an experience, and I'll pass through it. There is something here that is for my highest good. All is well. Just breathe. It's okay. And I do the best I can to calm myself so I can think rationally about whatever is going on. And of course, I do work through everything. It may take a little time, but sometimes things that seem to be great disasters really turn out to be quite good in the end, or at least not the disasters that they seem to be in the beginning. Every event is a learning experience. I do a lot of positive self-talk, morning, noon, and night. I come from a loving space of the heart, and I practice loving myself and others as much as I possibly can. My capacity to love expands all the time. What I do today is much more than I was doing six months or a year ago. I know a year from now my consciousness and my heart will have expanded and I'll be doing even more. I know that what I believe about myself becomes true for me, so I choose to believe wonderful things about myself. There was a time when I didn't, so I know I have grown and I continue to work on myself. I also believe in meditation. To me, meditation is when we sit down and turn off our dialogue long enough to hear our own inner wisdom. When I meditate, I usually close my eyes, take a deep breath, and ask, what is it I need to know? I sit and listen. I might also ask, what is it I need to learn, or what is the lesson in this? Sometimes we think we're supposed to fix everything in our lives and maybe we're really only supposed to learn something from the situation. I remember when I first began to meditate, I had violent headaches for the first three weeks. Meditation was so unfamiliar and against all my usual inner programming. Nevertheless, I hung in there, and the headaches eventually disappeared. 
If you are constantly coming up with a tremendous amount of negativity when you meditate, it may mean that it needs to come up. And when you quiet yourself, it starts to flow to the surface. Simply see the negativity being released. Try not to fight it. Allow it to continue as long as it needs to. If you fall asleep when you meditate, that's all right too. Let the body do what it needs to do. It will balance out in time. Reprogramming your negative beliefs is very powerful. A good way to do it is by making a tape with your own voice saying your affirmations. Play it as you go to sleep. It will have a great deal of value for you because you will be listening to your own voice. An even more powerful tape would be your mother's voice telling you how wonderful you are and how much she loves you. Once you have the tape, it's good to relax the body before you begin reprogramming. Some people like to start with the tips of their toes and move to the top of their head, tensing and relaxing. However you do it, breathe and release the tension. Let the emotions go. Get to a state of openness and receptivity. The more relaxed you are, the easier it is to receive the new information. Remember, you are always in charge and you are always safe. It's wonderful to listen to tapes or read self-awareness books and do your affirmations. But what are you doing for the other 23 hours or so a day? You see, that is what really matters. If you sit down and meditate and then get up and rush to work and scream at somebody, that counts too. Meditations and affirmations are wonderful, yet what you do at other times are just as important. Treat doubt as a friendly reminder. I'm often asked questions about whether people are doing affirmations correctly or whether they are even working, and about doubt. I'd like you to think of doubt a little differently than you may have been. I believe that the subconscious mind resides in the solar plexus area of the body where you carry those gut feelings. When something sudden happens, don't you immediately get a strong feeling in your gut? It is where you take everything in and store it. Ever since we were little children, every message we have received, everything we have done, all the experiences we have had, all that we have said, have all gone into the filing cabinets right there in the solar plexus area. I like to think that there are little messengers in there, and when we think thoughts or have experiences, the messages go in, and the messengers file them in the appropriate files. For many of us, we have been building up files labeled, I'm not good enough, I'll never make it, I don't do it right. We have gotten absolutely buried under these files. Suddenly, we do a few affirmations such as, I'm wonderful and I love myself. And the messengers pick them up and say, what's this? Where does it go? We've never seen this one before. So the messengers call doubt. Doubt, come over here and see what's going on. So doubt picks up the message and asks the conscious mind, what's this? You've always been saying the other things. And on a conscious level, we can react in two ways. We can say, oh, you're right, I'm terrible, I'm no good, I'm sorry, that's not the right message, and go back to our old ways. Or we can say to doubt, that was the old message, I have no need for it now, this is the new message. Tell doubt to start a new file, because there will be lots of these loving messages coming through from now on. Learn to treat doubt as a friend not the enemy, and thank it for questioning you. Use it to strengthen your new beliefs. It doesn't matter what work you do in this world. It doesn't matter if you are a bank president or a dishwasher, a housewife or a sailor. You have wisdom inside of you that is connected to universal truth. When you are willing to look within and ask a simple question such as, what is this experience trying to teach me? And if you are willing to listen, then you will have the answer. Most of us are so busy running around creating the soap opera and drama we call our lives that we don't hear anything. 
Don't give your power over to other people's pictures of right and wrong. They only have power over us when we give our power to them. Groups of people give their power over to others. It happens in a lot of cultures. Women in our culture often give their power to men. They say things like, my husband won't allow me to. Well, that's certainly giving your power away. If you believe it, you box yourself into a place where you can't do anything unless you are given permission by another person. Who do you give your power to? The more open-minded you are, the more you learn, and the more you can grow and change. A woman once shared with me that when she got married, she was very unassertive because that was the way she was brought up. It took years for her to realize that her conditioning kept her locked in a corner. She blamed everyone, her husband and her in-laws, for her problems. Eventually, she divorced her husband. However, she still blamed him for so many things that were not right in her life. It took her 10 years to relearn her patterns and to take her power back. In hindsight, she realized that she was responsible for not speaking up and for not standing up for herself, not her husband or her in-laws. They were there to reflect back to her what she felt inside, a sense of powerlessness. Don't give your power away based on what you read, either. I remember years ago I read some articles in a well-known magazine and I happened to know something about each subject described in the articles and in my opinion the information was totally erroneous. The magazine lost all credibility for me and I didn't read it again for many years. You are the authority in your life so don't think that because something is in print that it's always the truth. Inspirational speaker Terry Cole Whitaker wrote a wonderful book called What You Think of Me Is None of My Business. It's true. What you think of me is none of my business. It's your business. In the end, what you think of me is going out from you in vibrations and will come back to you. When we have illumination, when we become conscious of what we are doing, we can begin to change our lives. Life is really here for you. You need only ask. Tell life what you want and then allow the good to happen.